I think the next level of networking is also being a connector of people. It's when yeah. you get to use your network to actually start putting people together that you think should actually know each other and you almost start playing matchmaker. It's espresso teenies. I'm going to hit you and Jared both with a FaceTime. So I might hit you both at the same time just to really I, I gotta, mix I got to admit something here, guys. I have, I've tasted espresso martinis, but I always thought that it was more of a, a chick drink. So my wife would drink them or whatever. Yeah. Oh, it probably is. At, I don't care. At, at the is. addition. I don't care. Addition, I, I need the caffeine, brother. Dude. <laughs> and I'm too everybody ordered, ordered, ordered Vodka Red Bull. Uh, uh, <laughs> I can't order a Vodka Red Bull everywhere I like to go. Yeah. Everybody ordered a round of espresso martinis, and there was one extra one It was handed to me. That thing was damn delicious. That was fantastic. Yeah. So oh, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm a yeah. believer now. The, uh, the, the espresso martinis are martini. great. And, That's and the, the thing jam. is, you can't, there's certain places that you go where you just can't order a Vodka Red Bull. And there's right, certain places right. you go where you can't order an espresso like martini. The They're never the same place. Okay. <laughs> right. If you're somewhere where you're two or three deep at a bar and you have to yell for someone to hear you, if you order an espresso martini, you're okay. Hey, if, yeah. if one of their yeah. specials, if you're somewhere where it's nice and a sit down and there's ambiance, the lights are dim, and you order a vodka Red Bull, you're also. <laughs> so you have to know <laughs> where you are and order accordingly. Well, if there's it's a drink special the on the menu and the last word is bomb, probably shouldn't get a vodka, uh, uh, espresso martini. Then you should just get that wine bomb and keep it G, and, okay? And right. you should just get the chili dog and call it a night. Welcome everybody to the BDO Show, the podcast for battle-tested BDOs and those looking to level up their game to stay current with all things that surround this role of being an SBA BDO. Okay, BDOs, it's story time. And no, I am not talking about the time Sterling tried to finance a zoo. You'll have to go back to episode three for that. I'm talking about the story that your borrower has in their head, and they may need that extra boost to finally get it onto paper. Rapid Business Plans is a known and trusted partner that can help them do just that. Whether your borrowers are working towards acquiring a business, starting one up, or expanding and making moves, within just a few short days, Rapid Business Plans will deliver powerful, fast, SBA and USDA ready business plans with projections and assumptions. If they need an export business plan for an ITL loan or a feasibility study, they have you covered there too. We know this process is not a walk in the park, or should I say zoo? <laughs> Let the rapid business plans team take some of the wild out of the process so that your borrower's vision and passions can come to life. For more information or to get acquainted, email Bethany McClellan at Bethany at rapidbusinessplans.com or click the link in the show notes. You know, I was really excited to share this news. The results are in. We are officially the number one hyper niche podcast for government guaranteed lending in a group setup. So congratulations to you guys. And wow. thanks for everybody that's, you know, listening or watching, however you're consuming. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. That's super important. Um, today we're on a part two of an adventure. As the last episode, we were talking about adventures and networking early on in our career. And it became pretty obvious as we were all sort of going around that we had more stories and more stuff to share. So I kind of want to bring it back to the beginning and ask you guys if you have any good stories about networking either earlier on or maybe recently, something that didn't go according to plan, not a home run story, but maybe one that maybe, uh, maybe made us a little humble. You know, I want to get into that, but first I want to congratulate a special listener, Austin Porter on your graduation from junior lender to full blown BDO, no pressure. Congratulations. So all with that, pressure. all the pressure of hack stocking, but you know, it, it, with that, I open it up to you guys. Do, do any of you guys have a good story from when you're networking, either in the beginning or recently, where maybe things didn't go according to plan? I have one. I was thinking, like, man, you know, you just you network so much, it's hard to like think of. At least for me, think of a story that stood out. But I do remember prior to uh, me joining Toastmasters, it was actually the the impetus for me joining Toastmasters. I did the like opening speech at IBBA in front of, you know, there's thousands that are there. It was a yeah. breakfast speech. And I went out the night before, probably not my best self, didn't really prepare. I'm like, oh, I can just wing it. The sound, everything that could go wrong in a, in a public speaking engagement went wrong. The sound was going out. People were still eating. 
people were getting up and leaving. I was forgetting the words. I, it was just, it was horrible. It was so bad that networking later, people remembered me and just said, man, you were pretty terrible up there. <laughs> or, or man, you seem so nervous. <laughs> And so the rest, uh, that was the opening speech. So for the next three days, people remembered me from being on the stage, kicking off the conference, but it actually worked in my favor. There were people that had so much pity for me. I said, man, you're going to do great things. You know, you're at, you're at the bottom right now, but you just keep working hard. <laughs> you get it next time, me, champ. <laughs> one guy told me about Toastmasters <laughs> and I actually got a few like sympathy deals out of it. Some of the brokers I still work with to this day because I did so terrible on that stage. And I promised myself that would never happen again. And such uh, on, I went on and joined. And now life. Chris is like our best public speaker too. Every time there's a public oh, yeah. speaking engagement, it just automatically pretty much goes to Chris because that's just what Chris does. He is uh, he's yeah, the, now he's it's the a prince. Strength. Now it's a strength, but yeah. uh, it's just all about why do people want to talk to you? And people wanted to talk to me because I did such a terrible job and they wanted to, you know, put, emphasize that, which was cool. And then I was able to, hey, I actually do SBA loans, not public speaking. And uh, yeah, uh, so that's my story. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. I think one of the earliest, you know, f issues that I had with a uh, uh, networking thing is I worked for a larger financial institution. It's a pretty big financial institution. And they like to do every February through March this thing called Coney Days. Uh, up here in Metro Detroit, Coney Dogs are a big thing. It's a Detroit staple. It's a Michigan staple. They're basically chili dogs, right, with onions and mustard. And there's a lot of Coney Islands and a lot of what restaurants call Coney Islands, not the Coney Island in New York. And so what we would do is we would hire these guys from Coney Island. They would come in with these carts and we would feed uh, uh, CPAs. Uh, we would feed their entire firm during tax season, you know, because they're working 12 to 14 hour days, they, they don't get a chance to go out. So we would go set this up, have people make them Coney dogs, and then we would sit and network with them. Sounds phenomenal in theory, right? Except for two things. Number one, they're CPAs. Number two, it's during the busiest time of the year. They don't want to talk to anybody. They want to come in, stuff their face with a Coney dog and go right back into their office and finish working. So I remember the first couple of times we did this, we went to two very predominant local CPA firms that do a lot of small business and middle market type businesses. A lot of people know them in the market that work with businesses, either M&A, real estate, whatever the case may be. So I'm there with about four or five other business bankers and we're hanging around and there's line after line of CPA come and grabbing a Coney dog and sitting down. Some of them are sitting down. Some of them are just grabbing their lunch and going right back to their office, right? So the ones that are sitting around, I would sit down and I'd try to stop up a conversation with you. And while I'm talking and explaining stuff, I'm just staring at this guy across from me. He's making eye contact with me, saying nothing but stuffing his face with bite after bite <laughs> after bite of Coney dog, just you know, chili Slipping on the side the of his mouth, just staring at me, just glizzy, just hanging out and falling off onto the plate and blow him. Glizzy goblin. It sounds, like a, it's, it sounds like a Peterson family reunion, kind of. Oh, my goodness. It, it's just, and, and you know, here I'm about 15, 16 years later from when we were doing this, I'm sitting in an office full of CPAs. You know, you wait until after April 15th, they'll give you all the time you want. They'll sit, they'll chat, they'll go through their customer base, talk about what kind of deals you want to do, who's ready to retire, sell so you can finance the acquisition. They'd love to sit and talk to you. But during March, during February, they don't have time, man. They're 12, 14 hour days and then they're back in their office. So we did that a couple of times. I immediately kind of realized that this was something that uh, I'm, it's not going to be fruitful. It's not going to be beneficial. And the ones that did take our cards and speak with us, you know, a little bit, oh, they forgot all about us as soon as we left. They were too busy churning out and cranking out numbers. So what I did realize, what I did learn from this was number one, wait until after April 15th to set up these lunch and learns. Number one, number two, bring the lunch early. I would sit my assistant out there and I would do Del Taco, maybe I'll do Coney, whatever the food was in the area, bring it in, set up the lunch, have them eat the lunch, have a captive audience. When they're done eating, then I would talk to them. That way they could engage, they can ask questions, and they weren't sitting there stuffing their face, looking at the food and not listening to what I was trying to present and explain to them from a fundamental SBA type 
uh, presentation. So I got more business out of doing those type of setups with accountants and even brokerage firms than we ever did with this whole Coney Island thing. And honestly, I think they did that for like three or four years after that one year that I witnessed it. And I, I, I never went back. I never participated <laughs> just because. And, and, and maybe leave too. the glizzies at home. Yeah. You know? Leave the glizzies maybe at home. Maybe a different option would be a, a good way to go. Glizzies are just not professional. I just, I just yeah, that's not professional. A bunch of grown men just chowing down on, on just glizzies. And back it's just not the... Um, it's not the vibe. What is this, July? Um, no, it's, it's not the vibe. Yeah, I mean, you I mean, disagree. <laughs> tubed meat, tubed meat has a way of bringing folks together. You know, and, uh, <laughs> I, I, I kind of like it. Save it for it. July fourth. You know, yeah. Yeah. hey man, yeah. um, conies are a big deal up here in Detroit. You know, we 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 have uh, Coney Islands that fight against each other. We've got them right next to each other that just battle out on who's got the tastiest glizzy. Who's Glizzy makes so, the biggest snap whoa, when you bite into whoa, it. Whoa, this show is getting – where's Emily at? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are man. missed. You are missed. No, I, I just uh, remember uh, one time me and Alan were actually together. We were at a, uh, a self-storage conference, and uh, we were just kind of – you know, at, you go to these conferences and you exhibit, right? So you're standing in a hall for sometimes three or four hours at a time, and – you know, there's times where it gets super busy and there's times where it gets super slow. Well, this time it just happened to be kind of during one of the busy moments. And so we're busy. We're talking to a bunch of people. They're moving around. And all of a sudden, this gentleman pops up out of thin air and he just says, hey. And I'm like, uh, yeah, yes, sir. He says, what's the rate? And I was like, oh, uh, I mean, the, the rates right now, I you know, I guess anywhere from maybe, you know, eight and a half to nine and a half. And he goes, do you remember when rates were six percent? wasn't that long ago. And then he just walks away and just disappears back into thin air. As, as fast as he came, he left. And that was it. <laughs> it was just gone. And that, for some reason, that, that interaction just always stuck with me. And uh, me and Alan yeah. to this day, uh, <laughs> we, always say, we always say, it wasn't that long ago. It wasn't that long ago. Uh, you think he listens to the show, that guy? Uh, no. if, he, if he does, no. he's just listening for the rate. And as soon as he hears it, <laughs> click. <laughs> Wasn't that long ago. You guys ever take a, a meeting earlier on when you realize that the life insurance guy that works with a lot of business owners is taking you to lunch because he's pitching you the entire time and there's really no room for collaboration because I've had that happen <laughs> oh, in the beginning. And, the, and and shout outs to those guys. That's hard work, man. I respect the hustle like you wouldn't believe. But I remember sitting across from a guy, he's like, who are four other contacts in your network who might benefit from from getting a life insurance policy? I was like, dude, oh. wait, what? Like, oh, man, now it's a yeah, do you know presentation. Who's, do you know who's, yeah. <laughs> you, you know who's really yeah. notorious for that? I, I'm pretty sure they're nationwide, but we've got a big firm around here, Northwest Mutual. So I had a guy from Northwest Mutual about 10, 15 years ago, call me up, say, hey, man, I understand you're doing big SBA deals. You deal with a lot of acquisitions, this and that. I got to tell you, I've got a customer base about a mile long. All they are are business mm -hmm. owners. I handle their money. I stock it away. I invest it for them. You and I need to get together, have lunch, this, that, and the other. Same thing, Al. Went and sat with the guy, yeah. started chatting. He sat there eating, just listening to my story. I'm telling him about the different type of businesses that we like to do, this and that. And then I started, then I asked him, I said, so what type of customer base do you work with? And how do you think we can collab on this? And he went, dude, he went straight into the sales pitch. He's like, you know, I give my customers at a, a, a average rate return of about 11 to 12% per year. And do you have life insurance? Because I think we need to talk about life insurance. And he did this whole elevator pitch on life insurance and investments. And I found it took me a couple minutes because I, I thought this was like a legitimate lunch meeting. But it took me a couple yeah. minutes to realize this dude's trying to sell me life insurance. Yeah. And he's like, <laughs> and so I, I was really nice about it. And, and I, when the yeah. meal was over, I was like, all right, great. I got your contact information. If anything comes up, we'll stay in contact and, and this, that and the other. And he looks at me, he goes, no, you should come by the office. I want you to meet some of the other guys. And I want you to meet my boss and this and that. And, like, and I thought for a minute, I go, nah, no, nah, I'm good, man. I, I mean, I, I didn't say it like that, but I, I, I passed. I, I kept walking. <laughs> yeah. Nah, that, oh, oh man, Mr. Zernick. Yes. 
the CEO of Bay First National Bank. It is Thomas Zernick. How are you doing today, sir? A special Hayes. guest. Sterling. Sterling, Kelly, how are you doing? Hi, Alan Peterson, how are you doing? Yeah. Tom, how, how are you doing, man? Great to, well. good to see you. Great hey, to see you. You know, when you get into nice SBA, to meet you, Tom. I, hey, nice to meet you. You know, I got into SBA in the late 80s, and you had to send your loan file in a FedEx box to your local district office. And then four or five months later, they would call you and a- ask you questions. It was the most painful experience in the world. <laughs> in fact, I told my president, I'm never doing another SBA loan again. Man, I was wrong. <laughs> no, it but, you know, well, so <laughs> let, let me ask you, Tom, I, I heard that you're from the Michigan area. You used to live up here. Yes. Right. Yep. Were yep. you doing SBA loans in the 80s up in the Michigan area where you used to have to go down to the McNamara building to drop them off yes. and have them reviewed? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. When, when I started, I started in 2000. We were still doing the same antiquated review process yep. where you package them up, yep. get them nice physical copies and go all the way down to the McNamara building. And at the time, you know, God bless her, Leslie Gertz was like my contact down there. And yep. I would try to. See, you know, talk her up, see if I could get my pet, my uh, uh, files to go to the head of the line to be reviewed. And it was just yeah. such a long process. That is a, such a small world. You know, we ended up hiring Melanie Duke and all. Do you remember her? Get out of here. She yeah, was absolutely. Also, I remember her. She was an SBA lender and we, we brought her in to kind of start up our SBA group and, and uh, we wanted to tap into her experience. But we, you know, I remember those guys, Dick Temkin was the director in Detroit. Right. And I actually got to be pretty good friends with Dick. I remember fact, his retirement uh, party. Yeah, I remember one year we uh, had a booth at the uh, Buick Open in Flint. Oh, nice. Yeah. And we were on the outskirts of hole 17, which is the really rowdy golf hole. <laughs> and Dick Temkin was standing next to me and Tiger came up with his caddy and they were walking by us. And Dick Temkin took his camera out and started taking pictures of Tiger. And his caddy yelled at Dick and said, hey, drop the photos. You know, you're not allowed to shoot. So I'm like, great. I'm like, Dick, man, you're going to get us thrown out of this place. But a lot of fun up in Michigan, a lot of fun with SBA. But, you know, being an SBA, it's like being in the mob. You never leave the family. I don't care. I don't care what direction i go up in this bank or where i go in this bank i'm always going to be tied in i'm always going to be tied in to see hackney and nice. sterling yeah every time i get out they pull me back in pull me right back in yeah yeah hey hey thank god for that tom because i got my career to thank for that so i appreciate all your support always yeah well good to see you guys hey i gotta run but i just came in to say hi to one, chris for one more quick second, thing tom before uh, one more yeah. quick michigan thing can you please tell these guys about michigan coney dogs about how good Coney dogs are up here and how big they are? Yeah, well, yeah. First of all, I don't know what's inside a Coney dog, uh, but <laughs> no, Kogel, Kogel Franks had their processing plant over near Flint, Michigan, over by the airport. And okay, yeah. uh, I, we, we had, I grew up in Jackson in Michigan in my banking career early on, and we had the best Coney Island places in the world. And they would smother and cover. So they'd be the coney with chili sauce and onions and melted cheese. And oh, uh, yeah. I would, I remember when I was a drive up window teller, we had the Coney Island right next door and the guy would bring all the cash in to deposit. And I would smell like a Coney dog after I processed <laughs> his deposit, <laughs> counting all the money. Up. And I always got so onions hungry. And chili. And that's and that's probably why I look like I look today. I love those ponies. <laughs> that's awesome. Thanks, Tom. Oh, that's Amazing. awesome. Thank you, Tom. Man, that we was just, a, that's a pleasant just, surprise. We just, that's the we're CEO. In the show yeah. Now. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Show's over. Best best SBA guy, Tom Z, the legendary. At, we gotta use some of that. Up. Yeah. We got some, some Michigander that. game with, with Ryan Kroge. I little love Coney that. Talk. That was awesome. Absolutely, little, man. Little glizzy talk, never hurt. Uh, Where were we at? Yeah. Sorry. And that and that and that's why Tom is a legend, by the way. And that's why he was <laughs> instrumental in three people on this phone calls, SBA careers. And also the person who put this whole thing together, Ray Drew, was originally made yeah. an SBA lender by that gentleman, Tom Zernick. So um he's definitely 
He's made his footprint in the game. There's no doubt about that. Absolutely. Yeah. He's Absolutely. got a great tiki bar too, but that's for another episode. But uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Maybe one day. Well, we'll have to, there's actually a Sterling SBA episode that takes place live at the Tiki Hut, so you guys will have to go Ooh. check that out. That's I a like shameless that plug. Porter in the pool. It's, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I know. What are we talking about? Networking with Glizzies? What's now, networking? Let's talk, I would let's say talk about uh, this. Hot, hot dogs out of the way now. No, no Glizzies. How? No Glizzy. No Diddy. Uh, what do we do in regard to this? Now that we network differently, right? We're not taking the we're not taking the the the, the awkward lunch anymore, right? COIs are kind of coming to us. Uh, obviously, we're still doing different LinkedIn. We're doing conferences. We're doing things like that. Are there any other ways that you can think that your kind of go to market strategy has changed, or is it just that you become established? You keep some of those key relationships. They keep feeding you while you start hunting from inside. You become more, you know, uh, setting traps rather than planting seeds. What, is it, what does it look like as you develop? Because I'm sure there's a lot of listeners that would want to know more about what that looks like. It, we're talking about networking in particular. Like you have the ability to dive deeper now with the connections you already have. So, for example, we were half my team was at a lunch today for Business Brokers of Florida, the Tampa chapter. And I wasn't yep. going there. I was looking for maybe some lenders to hire, but I wasn't going there. Oh, I need to meet four or five new brokers. The I knew 70% of the room, the 70% I knew I'm stopping. I'm talking. I'm, oh, how's your daughter? How was that yep. trip? I'm like diving deep. I'm not saying a single thing about a single loan. I met one of them. They actually brought his wife who was working the checkout table. I had never met her in person before. Um, so you're able to do a deeper dive and build a stronger connection. And I think that's important when you're networking. Um, the initial conversation obviously is surface level. You're just getting your contact. But when you see them again, like go deeper. Don't make it transactional. I'm a lender. You're a broker. I'm a lender. You're a CPA. Try to find some sort of connection, right? Where'd you go to school? You know, what type of hot dogs do you like to eat? Uh, what type, <laughs> like find a way to connect, to connect and build on that rapport and just dive deeper. And I think as you get more established, you can kind of relax because there's not a sort of desperation for a lot of new contacts coming in. So the ones you have, Ryan, I know you've mentioned that a lot, uh, Krogi, about you going to your COIs like birthday parties for their kids and things like that. And these are, that's still networking, but it's just mm -hmm. a different form. It's just showing up. And I guarantee you, when you go to those kids' birthday parties or the family events, you're not talking about, hey, this deal is structured this way. You might mention that for all of 30 seconds, but it's a different form of networking when you get a little bit more established. Yeah, that's a big thing. And and also not just deepening relationships, which I certainly agree with what Chris is saying, but I think the next level of networking is also being a connector of people. It's when yeah. you get to use your network to actually start putting people together that you think should actually know each other and you almost start playing matchmaker. Like, you know, for example, um, today I had a woman who was a mortgage broker reach out to me and say, hey, do you know anybody who's a commercial broker who potentially uh, has plots of land that they have listed? And so I was able to reach out to somebody who I had already met with previously a couple of weeks ago for lunch and say, hey, I'm gonna put you on a text together. You guys need to talk. And then I took the same uh, the same woman and I put her on a text with Adam Curtis, the head of our Pinellas division and said, hey. This woman has commercial deals. She needs somebody who can do something conventional. Maybe you can pass her down to Melanie or Alex Jaber or somebody like that. So when you get to that level where you start to know a lot of the players in your space, when somebody comes to you and they have an ask, or even when they don't even have an ask, maybe you're just like, you meet somebody and you just say, hey, you know, you need to meet so-and-so because they do yeah. something that could actually help you. I think that people remember that. And, and um, when th when those people meet up, guess who they're going to talk about first? They're going to talk about you. You know, yeah. uh, they're going to say, the oh, connection. man, I'm so glad Sterling put us together. And, you know, he's such a great guy. And yeah, he's a good guy. And, you, you know, because you do it all the time when somebody puts you with somebody else. The first thing I say, oh, man, Alan's a great guy, isn't he? And, uh, you yeah. know, that, that type of stuff, it, it uh, makes a difference for you in the long run. You got to kind of pass it down a little bit. And that's exactly what I was going to say, Sterling. I mean, almost word for word, you, you start to build your relationship. And by building your relationship and deepening the relationship, you build a reputation. And then once you build a mm -hmm. reputation, those COIs that you have the relationship with start talking about you to other people in their field. Start talking to other people that need your services. You're now front of mind. You're top of mind. 
you're the first one that they're going to talk about. And by reciprocating, when you have somebody to easily refer to that COI, that just builds and deepens that relationship. And now you've got a, a nice circle of uh, network that we can all share business, we can all do business together, and we can all do life together. It's fun when you develop COIs in different industries and different aspects that all do business together, but then you get to do fun stuff like go golfing and, and, and have families over for parties and stuff and actually do life together. That's when the relationships really start building. And that's when you start, you stop becoming, coming to your job and you actually have fun, you know, yeah. doing what you do. Yeah. I love connecting people. I, I, I think that's, you know, it, it, it boils down to just showing value, right? Like just to ultimately be able to show value keeps you around. You know, in general, it, it's a good, it, it, if you have a function, then you have a place. And I think, you know, growing those relationships that way is awesome. You know, Ryan, I know you mentioned it on episodes previously, but I really admire how you take good notes of people's anniversaries. You know, that's a date that not everybody in the world is, is, is you know, it's not social media. Happy birthday. Thanks. You know, like, hey, happy anniversary is a very, very personal kind of touch that I think likely goes a long way, you know, and, and yes, you actually do care about it. But additionally, I think it really pivots you in a different in a, in a different level of relationship with that with those individuals, right? It's something that I'm actually trying to kind of work on myself. And it's an excuse to reach out too. when I see that an anniversary is yeah. coming up, I'll shoot him a text that morning, and say, Hey, happy anniversary to you and the wife. How many years is this already? You know, and then that's it. Start talking back and forth. And next thing you know, a week later, he's like, hey, you know, I was thinking about you. I've got this guy I want you to meet. I'm going to send you his contact information to make that introduction. Yeah. It's simple yeah, stuff, man. With, it's, it's keeping that relationship going. Absolutely. And then yeah. LinkedIn, I mean, it shows when people's birthdays are, uh, at the date at least, um, if they put that information in there. So if you're on LinkedIn, you see there's a referral source. It's their birthday. I encourage you, don't message them via LinkedIn. Everyone's probably doing that, or a lot of people. Yeah. Send their text. You have their cell, yeah. shoot them a text. Yeah. Say, hey, right. I yep. do that all the time. I, I won't message via LinkedIn. I'll see, oh, it's this CPA's birthday or this referral source's birthday. Shoot them a text. Happy birthday. What's going on? Or enjoy the day. I'll catch up with you later. And then call, try to call them the next week, like, hey, man, how was your birthday? Or what'd you end up doing? You know, and they'll, they're going to see that last text message from you too. So I, I would encourage people to go beyond. Uh, I know we talk about LinkedIn here, but you can't survive alone. Uh, man, what is it? No. Bread enough is not alone. Isn't that the quote? Uh, LinkedIn an, alone is not enough. Um, go and, beyond and I, that. I think it's more personal too when you actually physically text that individual directly as opposed to messaging through social media. I know messaging through social media is nice and easy. You're right there. You see something, you think of something, and you message right away through social media. But it, it takes a more personal touch that when you see a birthday, you see them get a, a promotion like Austin got today. Um, you don't just send them a LinkedIn message or send them a Facebook message. Pick up the phone, give them a call or shoot them a text uh, on the cell phone. I guarantee you, you'll get a much more personal response back as well. Another tip, too, when I was just at this networking function, there was a lot of like if you're still doing physical business cards or paper business cards, I think that's a little bit antiquated. Try to use some form of a digital business card. The, the very simple yeah. reason is you get in that person's phone. So there was one person I had I just met got brand, I just got a whole new box of well, business I cards. Some, <laughs> I, of course this, you have them. This bro. just came to today, dude. <laughs> just no. got these today. <laughs> You're, uh, telling, you're, right. you're telling you me that, that I, yeah, I'm, toss... I'm, I'm obsolete now? No, I need to get that's, digital. That's mail them probably too. <laughs> <laughs> of course I do. I've, I've, got, I've got thank yeah. you cards down here that I mail out with them. <laughs> but the reason why, when you do that digital card, you get in that person's contact. So what I've found is they scan my digital card. I'm in their phone. I've got my picture. It says Chris Hackney, Bay First, SBA. It's one less thing for them to do. So think, yeah. when Ryan hands me a business card, I don't know, Ryan, I have to go in save his name, save his number, type in his email. We are all so busy as human beings. When am I going to have the time besides maybe a long flight to actually sit down and do that? So reality is that those cars sit on the side. Let's keep it real. But Ryan can still call me because he's probably got my card and I'll see like a, mm -hmm. a strange number and probably pick up. But the difference is I'm going to have my contact in that referral sources phone that shows my picture, my name, who I am. When I call them, we're going to say, 
oh, this is Chris. I remember this guy from this conference or he's an SBA lender, right? It's not a strange number. So if you can, um, you know, depending on your year of birth, convert to some form of a digital so, business so card just, that might help. Just you. for our viewers, Chris, what is the name of the app that you use for that? I use I, I use Popple. <laughs> uh, this is not a, a an Popple. Is that with one P or two P's? One P. P O P L. There's also uh, was it Blink, Bink, or there's another. There's like three or four. Uh, of them I use out Popple there. as well. Yeah. Okay. Is Popple the one? Right. Yeah, you they, had one at IBBA, didn't you? Yeah. So somebody turned me on at IBBA called Hello. So it's an app called Hello, and I entered all in all my stuff. But uh, it, it seems weird because they sent me the information through Hello. But if you don't have Hello, it doesn't populate into your contacts. Oh, like what I've been using for the last five years is uh, an app called Business Card Reader. So it, sometimes it oh, works well, sometimes well. it doesn't. But if you take a picture of a business card, it'll populate all the contact information into your Apple contacts. Oh. Or, you know, if you're uh, really yeah, old, Cam your Google Card contacts. does that as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cam Card does that as well. That's another good feature. Okay. If you're networking again you're, and you get a lot of, um, you know, physical business cards, same concept. You can scan those uh, cards with your phone. It's not 100 percent accurate, but it'll, it's maybe 80 to 90 percent. But it saves you some steps from having to type in. Allison Peter, Alan Peterson, Alan Peterson at FIB.com. Like you don't have to go through all those steps and it's quicker, right? It's all about yeah. being yeah. efficient with your time. And I, I like being able to share the digital card as well, Chris. You can go into a room full of uh, brokers and just airdrop everybody at once. Oh. <laughs> How about some uh, general networking tips here? I mean, does anyone still know how to work a room? How, Alan, how well, do you how do you break off a conversation with somebody who's lingering too long? How about that? If I'm in a if I'm in a conference and somebody is lingering too long and I'm at the booth, um, I'll usually I'll usually politely kind of wrap up whatever it is we're talking about, give a good time for us to follow up on that thought, and then pivot with my body language and pretend to go greet someone else at another table that I'm really not going to, to speak with. <laughs> Is yeah, how I would. And then they take I, five steps down it's, the it's, hall it's and look like, back, and you're still standing at the booth. Still, I yeah, run, I I'm run, just going right. Yeah, 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 I do no, that as well. Uh, I do the shoulder pat. I'll I'll pat them on the shoulder and kind of just two, say, hey, two pats. Good. That's a good means physical get cue. going. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know it's pats, like, like, hey, this has been good. Let's catch up. I'm going to run over yeah. here real quick, and people get that that uh, body language cue there, that physical touch cue, just you know, with consent, yeah. of course. Yeah, two pats is always get going. Yeah. But what do you think is the appropriate time to speak to somebody? You know, when you're at like a luncheon like that, everybody lets out and, you know, it starts to become a real networking event. I mean, how, how long do you think you should sit and talk to somebody and try and build rapport with them? I mean, three to four minutes, shouldn't maybe five. If you're going to like right. 10 minute conversations and you, you're, only, you're reducing the number of people you can actually meet. I, when I was, you know, super heavy in the networking, I had a goal of meeting like at least four people, right? Building some form yeah. of a connection in that room because beyond that it's very hard you're probably having very surface level conversations so i want to come out here and meet four people that i've established some sort of connection with and you know four times five is 20 minutes of networking and then the rest of the time i would just do soft touches on the way out when i'm leaving just hey i'm chris sorry i didn't get a chance to meet like you know give them a compliment or something let me get your card or here scan this real quick i'll catch up with you so those can be on your exit you can meet three or four more people and you keep those at you know, 30, 45 seconds at best, because then you're kind of doing that towards the door. You're heading out yeah. and your language is leading that way. So anyone you see, like I see Sterling on that, on the way out. Oh man, you're at, you know, you're at Bay First. Oh, I've, I've seen your podcast real quick. Hey, take my contact real quick. I'm heading out. You do that two or three times. So you've met four people, you built some connections on the way out the door. You, you grab four more people. That's eight people right there that you should be able to follow up with at an event um, and not waste too much time. And if there's somebody that you want to get introduced to and you know some people there at whatever function it is, you could always ask that individual that you know, hey, I saw you talking to so-and-so. Do you mind making an introduction? I know someone at that firm and I'd really like to get a uh, get a foothold in there. Nine times out of 10, they'll easily introduce you. And that goes yeah, to Sterling's ask. point, making the connections yeah. uh, too. I know you mentioned via text, but I do that a lot at, at networking events or when I, when I know two people that should meet. Hey, you got to meet this lady. Hey, you should meet this lady. You should meet the CPA and just bring them together right there. They're both going to, mm -hmm. you're both going to elevate in their book right there because you made an in-person real-time uh, connection for them. Absolutely.
And what about any uh, networking horror stories? Any uh, any bad ones that anyone wants to share? Well, I had one today, actually. I, I You know what? Most of my horror stories are, are, you know, maybe a deal didn't go well or maybe someone was a bit nasty via email and you actually meet them in person. So I had one yeah. today, actually, at this event. And there's this lady who like just basically cursed me all the way to like, I don't know, to Indiana or wherever. And uh, she was just so nasty, so mean. I was a young lender and the deal blew up. It wasn't our fault. It was like some environmental stuff and all the so nasty. And I saw her today and, you know, I, I had to give my little spiel on the bank and she was just so complimentary of my growth. I guess she'd been watching me in the shadows, but she just she never you know. She saw you in IBBA way back when. Way back when, yeah. <laughs> but I've had a lot of times where you don't have good interactions via email and maybe you met them via like LinkedIn virtually. And then when you meet them in person, um, it's a little bit better. Um, so you actually yeah. build better rapport rather than- It's a little like bit a harder to story. talk spicy to a, a grown man's face. Let's just be honest. Let's just be honest. There's one guy, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna say his name, but I think we know, most of us know who I'm talking about, but he told me to yeah. politely F off. Uh, on a call yeah. and I didn't take that so well. And I saw him the next night at a, at a happy hour event and I addressed him uh, as he should be addressed. And I also say, Hey, you're not, you know, you're a lot nicer in person. I noticed, you know, you were talking a little <laughs> bit different on the phone and via email. And then he just, yo, know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And takes me to the side and gives me this apology tour stuff too. So um, there's a way you can address people professionally at networking events too. And, correct some misunderstandings uh, in a professional manner as well. And people will appreciate that. And, and look, absolutely. as a BDO, the more business you do, you are going to have situations where deals go south. You're going to have, especially environmental. Environmental stuff always it makes it a real rough closing and a real rough process. Uh, but you're going to have those COIs or you're going to have those brokers or customers that you've done business with that for whatever reason, they just didn't like the process or they didn't like something about the way the transaction went down. The best advice I, and I'm sure the guys can agree with me, when you meet these people in person and they want to act a fool, stay professional. Stay professional because everybody's watching. Everybody's yeah. listening. Yeah. They're seeing how your demeanor is, how you react. And at the end of the day, when someone's acting the fool and somebody's trying to shine you on in front of other people, that person's going to look like the villain and you're going to look like the professional. Because let's face it, there, there's not a BDO out here that has every single deal go perfect. There just isn't. Right. There, you're going to have rough rides. I, I used to tell people all the time in SBA, if it ain't rough, it ain't right. Uh, that's just kind of the way it goes. There's so many things. And that that's from the glizzy god himself. That's from the glizzy god, baby. <laughs> hey, yo. Oh, that's going to be a thing now, isn't it? <laughs> hey, <laughs> Unfortunately for you, Ryan. I'm wow. t what, what did Tom say? He said smothered uh, and covered. Is that what he smothered said? And Man, smothered and covered. I am covered. I can just see we the t-shirt that Hackney's going to find for that one. It's already in print. Yeah, it's already in production. You know, we we want to we take this from reminder we want to take this reminder to, to ask everybody who might be listening or tuning in uh youtube or wherever to make sure that you send any questions or scenarios into into the bdo show at art of sba lending.com because we want to keep you covered and smothered in the information you need to That's keep right, your baby. career leveling up so make sure to like and subscribe. Again, it is the BDO show at artofsba.com. I did not get it wrong the first time. That was that was just that, one take that was out. Just, it was just something that you heard. Yeah, one take out. One take out. Perfect That's every time. <laughs> and, and, and with that, I'm off to Charlie's. It's been real. Thank you, guys. Have a great week, guys. <laughs> take it easy, fellas. See ya.